Okay, I, I will always, uh, forever, remember one of my final exams that I had at seminary, one of my final exams before I, I went out into pastoral ministry that will be forever etched uh, in my memory. I studied at ETS, which we've mentioned a moment ago, didn't we? Edinburgh Theological Seminary. So you can picture, there I am in the exam hall. Oh, <laughs> the fear. I'm there in the exam hall in the center of the city, in the center of Edinburgh. As an aside, almost unbelievably, every year the same thing happens. At exam time, uh, a busker, <laughs> he sets himself up outside the exam hall and what is he playing? Almost unbelievably, he's playing the bagpipes. Can you imagine you're trying to do your final Greek exam or your final Hebrew exam? And outside, there's a guy, and he's butchering Scotland the Brave on the pipes. Anyway, there I am, trepidation in the exam hall, and I uh, turn over the paper. This is one of the first tasks that I was asked to do. So they asked me to design my own worship service. Okay, Design my, you can see the idea, can you? After these years of study in seminary, doing all this sort of theoretical stuff, okay, fine, great, design your worship service. What parts, how does it flow? What's to happen in a worship service? What do you think? You're thinking, oh, that sounds a bit easy. You know, seminary's a write-off. Are you thinking it sounds very straightforward? Well, is it? I mean, what would you do? I mean, what is important here right now on a Sunday morning? Like, what elements should make up this, this worship service? Or, you could, you could go further, who is it that should be participating in the worship service? What, what are the component parts? You see, I think, honestly, to be frank, I think because we're so diverse, sort of theologically, we would have loads of different ideas, wouldn't we, about a worship service? So there'd be a lot of people in here who would want a really sort of firm, strict liturgy, wouldn't you? Maybe some would want smells and bells and that sort of thing. There would be others in the room who want, in, you know, want a lot of flexibility so that the Holy Spirit can lead us in the worship service. Some would want like lots of call and response type stuff. Others would want oh, nothing of the sort. Yes? Okay, but the question remains, the question still stands, what should our worship service look like at St. Peter's? And then why? So, can I invite you please to have this portion of uh, Scripture open? Because this morning what we find is an abrupt change in the book of Joshua. We're getting back into the sermon series. Do you, do you see what I mean by an abrupt change? Where were we if you cast your mind back a few weeks ago? Can you remember where we were? We were on a battlefield. Do you remember the bloody ambush, the bloody victory over AI? But maybe you notice, as Chris read this out, that it changes. There's a sudden transformation. We are whisked away from the battlefield. Suddenly, we're at this, it's a ceremony. It's a covenant renewal ceremony. And as we do what we do on a Sunday morning, as we hush ourselves to seek to listen to our almighty God and his word, what I think we'll hear are some principles in Joshua 8 for St. Peter's. So principles here in these verses that can help inform, guide, govern how you and I are to worship and worship in a way that pleases our God. Okay, so you've got the Bible ready. The young people, you can see a copy of Scripture, I'm sure. Um, let's think first of all, let's notice the authority in corporate worship. That's the first thing we've got to get heads around, the authority in corporate worship. Um, What's that phrase? Uh, you, you can't see the wood for the trees. That's the phrase, isn't it? You can't see the wood for the trees. You know that phrase. That, that sometimes we lose, because there's so many details or something, we lose sight of the big picture. Can't see the wood for the trees. Ah, I don't want that to happen. There's a lot of details. It's not many verses, but there's a load of details here in Joshua 8, aren't there? And I don't want us to lose sight of the wood for the trees. So let me do this to start out. Let me throw out 
a big idea and you catch it, okay? Both hands. Don't fumble the big idea, okay? It's just a big idea. We see in Joshua 8 the importance of the Word of God in corporate worship. So we see in these verses, I'll say it again, make sure you catch it, don't drop it. We see the importance of God's Word in corporate worship, the importance of Scripture. Now, there's a big idea. We've all got it, we see it, we hear it. But how do we see it in Joshua chapter 8? Let me just point you to a few things to think about. First of all, as the adherence to God's Word. Because let me just, I suppose, lead into this by addressing what is the elephant in the room this morning. And that is that this portion of Scripture seems a little bit strange. Is that fair enough? Are we thinking along those lines? I mean, think about it for a moment, Joshua 8. Think about it in terms of a military strategy. What are the people doing? Come on, they're conquering the land. And you can see it, can you? It's like, we'll get Jericho. Yes. And then what will we do? We'll go into AI. Yes, we'll defeat AI. What's next? What's next? Let's walk 25 miles up into the hill country. Let's stand on a couple of mountains and let's shout back and forward to each other. That's what happens here. Are we not scratching our heads a little bit and thinking, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Why? Are they doing this? Well, to answer this, I need your help. Okay, so I need you, please do this. I need you just to turn back a few pages. I'll give you the reference. Deuteronomy 27, verse 4. Deuteronomy 27, verse 4. Now, we might not like flicking about in our Bibles in a worship service. Maybe we do, we don't. This will shed light for us on this whole episode, okay? So, you get in there? Deuteronomy 27, verse 4. So this is God speaking. He speaks through Moses. Now, listen, he speaks just before the people go in to the promised land. God speaks. What does he say? And you see it in verse 4? He commands them, when you have crossed the Jordan, when you get into Canaan, you're going to set up these stones and worship. What's the next bit? At Mount or on Mount Ebal. Do you see it? Like it might be an elementary point, but do you see what I'm saying to you? Do you see what we got there? We're asking, why did he do this? Joshua 8 seems a little bit strange. Why are they worshiping like this? What's the answer, friends? They're doing this out of obedience to God's word. God has commanded this worship so the people of God, they do it. They adhere to God's word. That's the first thing. Second thing, we've got to think about the actions with God's word. So we're in Deuteronomy, are we? Everyone, can I ask you, jump back to Joshua chapter 8. Sorry, we're back and forward. Let's go back to Joshua 8. And can I ask you to look up verse 32. In Joshua 8, 32. Now the question we're asking here is, well, what did they do in this worship service? Like, how did, how did it happen? What were the parts of it? Now read it with me. What does Joshua do? In the presence of the people, Joshua writes on these stones of worship, what's the next bit? A copy of the law of Moses, friends. Okay, so what's, what happens in the worship service? Joshua writes out a copy of the law. Now again, come on, I've got to hold my hands up. Again, you, you've got to maybe be thinking, this sounds a little bit strange, right? The, the terms of the law. But listen, in the ancient world, when two parties entered into an agreement with one another. Okay, so let's say it's two men or two nations, two peoples. When they entered into an agreement together, what they would sometimes do, if they want to renew this agreement or strengthen the agreement, they would get back together again. They would meet up and what would they do? To strengthen this agreement, they would both write out the terms of the treaty Now, don't you see? That is what is happening before you in Joshua chapter 8. Don't you understand? You have God and Israel. And what have they done? They've covenanted together. So do you see Israel's response here in the ceremony? What does Israel do? Before God, in worship, they have Joshua write out the treaty, write out the covenant stipulations. Everybody with me? 
You have the word of God. Yes, command worship, but you have the word of God play a central role in the worship service as well. So we've got that, but then it's all leading to this point, and that is the authority of God's word. Because we've been jumping about Um, But we were in Deuteronomy 27, and I wonder, I didn't give you a lot of time in Deuteronomy 27, but I wonder if you had a chance to flick through it or see some of the other bits of the chapter. You don't have to turn there just now. But if you did have a wee look at Deuteronomy 27, um, I wonder, did it say this? Did God command when you get into Canaan, you've got to go evil, you've got to worship me, and then did God say, and when you get there, Do as you please. Does Deuteronomy 27, does God say, go to Eba, worship my name. And when you get there, just wait to see how the Holy Spirit leads you. Is that what it says? Not a bit of it. If you noticed it, Deuteronomy 27 is incredibly prescriptive in how God is to be worshipped. Did you notice Now listen to me, the people of God are told exactly where in the land, exactly where they're to worship. They're told who's got to take part. They're actually told where the ark is to be placed. They're told where the participants are to stand. Do you see the point I'm making? In Joshua chapter 8, everything in worship is appointed. Everything is prescribed and prescribed by God's holy law. Isn't that important for us at St. Peter's? I think you know what it's like, what it's been like over the last 18 months, two years. I mean, I'm guessing in a sense that it's been the same here as it was in London, but I'm pretty sure it was. What's happened in the pandemic right back at the early stages of the pandemic? I work worship services. I've had to be stripped back to the bare bones. Isn't that right? Can you cast your mind back? Surely that was like that here. Certainly was in London. You know, you go back to the start of the pandemic and I'm making videos. I'm editing videos and trying to like, they're not real worship services, but you get the idea. We're trying to broadcast them and they've got a really short reading and a wee prayer, a wee talk, that's it. Do you remember those times? Was it like that here? Well, look at us now. As things become a little bit more like normal, and as we begin perhaps to begin to add things back into our worship services, do we not at St. Peter's have to be actually very, very careful? Because yes, we are commanded to worship by God's Word, and yes, God's Word is to be central to everything we do. But what's this we're learning here? That actually all the parts of our worship, all the elements of our worship should be specifically directed by God's Word. We don't just do what we want to do. God's Word directs, appoints how we're to worship Him. We must obey that. Why? Because what do you want to do? What do I want to do? What does the Kirk Session want to do? We want to worship God in the way that He desires. So we see the authority here of God's Word in corporate worship. Second thing we see here are the participants in this worship service, the participants. Um, Let me uh, into the process uh, for a minister. One of the uh, first issues that a pastor or a minister has to do when we are thinking about preaching on a Sunday, one of the first things we've got to do is not to try and determine what God wants us to say from Scripture, you know, maybe all think that's the first thing that I've got to do, try and work out what God wants me to say from Scripture. It's not actually that. The first thing, if you take a step back from that, when I'm thinking about a sermon series, it's the first thing I've got to work out. I've got to work out where I'm supposed to speak from. I'm in a sermon series, how am I supposed to divide up the book of Joshua? Do you see the matter? Certainly in this section, you can see it. You can see the questions I've got to ask. You know, I've got to ask, should I take this section with what comes prior to it in chapter 8. Could have just done the whole chapter 8? Or could have done 7 and 8, the whole AI stuff? We could have done that together. We could have just preached the whole of Joshua in the one arc. Do you see the idea? How should a text be divided up? Well, ask just now, right now, you think with me about the participants in this worship service. As you and I think about that, I'm deadly serious when I say that You know, a minister could come along and preach 
a very full sermon series on who it is that gathers at Ebal and Shechem to worship God. Honestly, we're not going to do it. (laughs) But a minister could come and preach a full sermon series on who it is that gathers in this valley to worship God. Now, let me show you what I mean. And see if you agree with this. Could we not, first of all, have a sermon on the presence of the sojourners at Ebal. Now, do, do we know what, what is meant by sojourners? I'm sure that we do. So, sojourners were the group of people who were not originally part of Israel. Come on, think of Rahab. In a sense, she's a sojourner, isn't it? She wasn't originally part of Israel, but what's happened? She has come into Israel, not on a temporary basis, not on a temporary basis. She has, well, we go for converted you see? And she has become part of this community. Well, I ask you, did you notice that twice in this text, the presence of these outsiders, these sojourners, former outsiders, that it is mentioned here? And could we not linger on that for a moment? Think about it. Like, could we not, as we've thought about before, could we not have a sermon for the need for us as a community in this place to be a really open fellowship of believers. It's not an easy thing to be or to do. But could we, not, could we not linger on that? Could we not have a sermon on the need for us to be willing to embrace anyone who comes through those doors, regardless of their background, anyone who comes longing to worship the Lord Jesus Christ? We could, couldn't we? The sojourner second, I wonder if you would agree, could we not also have a sermon on the presence of kids at Ebal? Look at verse 35. Verse 35. Now, just as um, in other portions of Scripture, just as in Nehemiah 8, if you want, where the people of God, they gather together before him and worship, what does Scripture do? Scripture underlines the fact that the children were present in worship. Don't you love it, though? Have you got the ESV? I don't know what it is in the NIV, but do you see what it is in the ESV? Have you got it? Do you see how they're described? Isn't it great? The little ones. (laughs) The little ones were there. They weren't excluded. They were included in the worship of God. Couldn't we? Couldn't we at St. Peter's have a sermon on that? Should we not? Ought we not at least to pray fervently that we can work through that principle as a church. So there's sojourners, there's kids, but I think it's the third detail that should make you and me sit up because could we not also have a sermon on the presence of all Israel at Ebal? Now, I'll ask you this question. I'm going to sound rude here, and I I really don't mean to be rude, but did you notice that there was an emphasis in the text when Chris read it out or as you read it this morning before coming to church, uh, did, you, did you notice the emphasis in all Israel? So I'll sound rude and not meaning to be rude. We should have noticed that emphasis. Three or four times in the text, God underlines this fact. So you've got it at 32. You've got it. Look at the beginning of verse 33. Do you see it? Verse 35. All this, like, do, do you see the importance of that or not? Like, so it wasn't just, read in from the rest of chapter 8, it wasn't just the warriors, the AI, you know, who, who get up and they travel on up to Shechem to worship. It's not just them. Who was it? It's everyone. Now, just work through the reality of that. So you've got the mums. <laughs> you've got the mums, and they're gathering up their, their kids, and you've got the grannies and the granddads and, and all, and, and the infirm and so forth. And what are they doing? Do you remember what I said at the start of the summer? They're traveling 25 miles. <laughs> and they're traveling up the way, up the hill country. And it's dangerous. They're in an enemy territory here. And they all go up. And then do you see them in your mind's eye? Do you picture them? Vast crowd. And it's, no one is excluded. No one's left behind. And it's all of the people. It's all the wee kids there and the, the elderly folk. And, and they're all there. And they all are there for one purpose. And that is to worship the Lord God. And don't you agree? Yeah, we could, ha- could have a sermon on it. But do you not also agree that it would make a most pertinent sermon for us? Because what have we said very recently? We've said that the church in Scotland is going through, maybe not crisis time, 
But it's certainly going through a time of great declension, isn't it? There's a time through this pandemic we're seeing many people who were formerly very regular in attendance at church and, and, and they almost severing ties with churches, not coming to, to, to worship. And if, if that's the person at home, we are very sympathetic if there is genuine health needs, aren't we? We totally, we understand it. But we also know that that is not the case right across the board. And we know there are some people not engaging with worship and, and using many different things in this pandemic as an, an, as an excuse simply an excuse. So what do we have to bear in mind, Christian friends? You might say to me, we have to bear in mind that God desires that his people gather physically together. You might say that to me, even that he's commanded it in Hebrews 11. You might say, but there's more. And it's exciting, really exciting. I want you just to think about the disciples in John 20. And they gather together. Listen, the disciples gathered, and what happens? The post-resurrection Jesus comes to the disciples gathered, and he declares his peace. Or I ask you to think about the church in the book of Acts. Are they, are they all over the place? No, it's when the church comes together and the church is gathered. What happens? The Holy Spirit comes, rests, dwells with them at Pentecost. Do you see, it's not just that God desires worship. It is actually that God does miraculous things. God does very special things when his people come together together to worship. And so I implore you to emboss corporate worship in your diary. Let nothing else be a priority over this. Let's next Sunday do as they do here. And let all Israel, all Israel, come together to worship. So we see the authority, it's God's word. We see the participants. Who is it? All of us in worship. And the third thing is the demand of corporate worship. Um, do we all in the room know what is meant by a GPS? GPS. Now I've gone and got myself into bother there because I've just immediately forgotten what that stands for. Uh, what is global positioning system? That's it. Good. Uh, GPS, we know what GPS is, do we? So you open up your phone, you open up a map, and there'll be this little blue dot in your face. Won't it be pulsating? It'll show you uh, where you are. Well, if we had, if we were amongst the people of God in Joshua 8, and we opened our phone, and we had GPS, would you not agree with me that it is incredibly precise did you notice, if you've got Deuteronomy 27 and this section of Scripture, Scripture goes out of its way <laughs> to show you exactly where the people need to be. So I guess the question that I've got and I've, I've had in preparation, and the question you might have, is why? Now, if I asked you that, you might say, well, Andy, they go to Shechem, they go to Mount Ebal because Deuteronomy 27 commands them to. Would you say that to me? But I would say back to you, but why does Deuteronomy 27 specify this location? Do you see the, the point that I'm making the question? Why on earth? You've got all of Canaan, and it's a big place. Why is it that God goes to such lengths to say, no, you've got, no, no, it's not just you've got to worship me. You all have to go there. It has to be exactly at that point. Why? That's the question. You see the question? give you two very brief answers to it. First, they have to go to Shechem to underline God's faithfulness. Um, you know your Bible. I'm sure you know your Bible. You know your Bible probably better than, than I do. I'm sure you, you know your Bible well. So if I say the name Shechem to you, what do you think? Does it ring any bells, Shechem? I think for some of us, we, we think, yes, wait a minute, that's where Jacob but it was Genesis 33, Jacob buys a strip of land. That may be, does it ring a bell for some of us? If not, much more importantly, Shechem. It was a place in Genesis 12 where Abraham, now follow me, who's Abraham? Abraham, think about the link. Abraham is the one who first receives the promise of this land and in Genesis 12, Shechem 
is the very place where Abraham comes, receiving the covenant promises, and he builds an altar. Do you see the connection? Like, do you see what God is doing by his grace here? God in Joshua 8 specifies where they're to go. He says, you go to that place in order to remind the people of his enduring faithfulness. He says, you've come in the land, go back to the place where Abraham received covenant promises and built the altar so you will remember that time doesn't erode God's faithfulness. Doesn't erode it. There might have been hundreds of years past since Abraham, but God is still faithful to his word. That was true for the people of Joshua, and that is true for you. Time does not erode God's faithfulness to his promises. So that's one reason that they had to go to Shechem. The second reason, you're going to look at me and you're going to think it sounds very, very strange, that the people are told to go to this area because of the natural features of this place. Because I'm looking around and I know this about you, that some of you have been on holiday over the last few weeks and months, right? Where have you been? Some of you have been to Arran. Uh, some of you have been to Aviemore. Some of you have been to deepest, darkest England. Uh, some of you have been to the west coast of Scotland, even. Um, you've seen some great things. I want you to appreciate, really appreciate, that of all the great things you've seen, nothing compares to where these people were. Now, listen to me, please. Shechem, it sat at the foot of two mountains, between two mountains. So you've got Mount Ebal in the north and Mount Gerizim in the south. Okay, everybody with me thus far? So where are the people? If you're picturing, where are the people? They are in this little strip of land where these two mountains, they very, very nearly meet. So one guy writes about it, and he was visiting, and he says, see where they meet? It is the most beautiful valley in all of Palestine. Everybody able to picture it thus far? Now, this is the interesting thing. As these two mountains nearly meet, both mountains, they fall away and they reveal the series of sort of stone ledges that almost look like benches. And everyone who visits, it seems, says the same thing. Where we are just now resembles the most beautiful, naturally occurring amphitheater. Can you picture it? What do you think? That sounds amazing. But does it not sound also most suitable? Because what do the people have to do? Did you pick up on the details? You've got 12 tribes, and they're split in two. You've got six who have to station themselves on Mount Ebal, and you've got six tribes that are to station themselves on Mount Gerizim. Now, what happens? Follow me on it. What happens? I was going to say that the Levites in the middle, they read out the law. They don't. Listen. In the middle, the Levites read out the curses and the blessings of of the covenant. So can everybody picture it? You know, the Levites in the middle, they read aloud the curses associated with disobeying God. And then the people, only on Ebal, only on Ebal, they say on one, Amen, 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 Amen. Then it's back to the Levites. And the Levites, they read aloud all the blessings that are associated with obeying God and his law. What happens then? You know the answer. What happens? The other six tribes, this time on Gerizim, they cry out, Amen, Amen, blessings, Amen. Do you see what's going on? In corporate worship, the people of God are being reminded about the calling on their lives, reminded about the covenant stipulations. In worship, the people are being reminded there is obedience. Obedience called for out of relationship with God. And let me take you back to the start of the sermon. Take you back into that exam hall. Hopefully you're not hearing the bagpipes. That actually the worship service is a difficult thing to put together. There are lots and lots of different elements to it, aren't there? Come on. We know when there's praise, confession of sin, assurance of pardon, all of these things. Is it not true that's part of our worship very regularly at St. Peter's, we must be reminded of the calling on our lives, the calling to holiness. Sunday by Sunday, reminded there is an obedience called for from you to God's Word 
out of your relationship to Jesus Christ. So allow me to do that right now, not just to talk about it, but to ask you, how is your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ this morning? You. You know, we've gone through this maybe season, a holiday for some people. What has it been like for you? Has it revealed more disobedience areas where you have not repented and you're walking in sin? If so, I urge you right now to hear from Mount Gerizim, <laughs> to turn away from that disobedience, to hear from Gerizim there are blessings, blessings that God longs to pour out on your life. But these are the blessings that come only with obedience to his word. So we see authority, we see participants, we see demand. But the last thing, very briefly, is the core, the real heart and center of our corporate worship. Okay, so if the sermon finishes right now, maybe some of you want it to, but if the sermon finished right now, I think you and I would be forgiven for going home with a pretty heavy heart. Don't you agree? We've just heard from the six tribes on Mount Ebal that there is judgment and curse, and it is given, pronounced, to those who disobey God's word. And what do, you, what do we all know in this place? That we are guilty, and every single one of us, from the youngest in this room to the oldest, we have disobeyed God's word. So do you see, if we left things right now, we're going home. And there's this curse, there's this reality of judgment upon our lives. But the sermon isn't quite finished because there is one crucial aspect that we have overlooked and deliberately passed by. And I would ask you to look for it in verse 30. First verse here. So it's verse 30. Let's everyone get it. What did I miss? What's the first thing in this worship, the center of it, the priority of it? What's the first thing Joshua does? You see, he builds an altar builds an altar in worship. So I just want to close just mentioning the two offerings that Israel makes on that altar. So you'll see them if you look at the end of verse 31. You see them. The first one is a burnt offering. Um, are you familiar with the offering system, the Old Testament sacrificial system? Do you know your way around it? Can you remember the details of it? If you do know it, you'll know about the burnt offering. You will know that the burnt offering was an offering, now listen carefully, that was to be wholly given over to God. That's going to be important for a minute. It's wholly given over to God. So it was burnt up, wasn't it, the animal, in order to give light of this pleasing aroma to God. Now, that's fine. This is the important detail you need to get. If you hear about the burnt offering again, you need to know from Leviticus 1 that the burnt offering was an offering for sin. Okay, everybody? So the burnt offering was an atoning sacrifice for sin. Now, with armed as you are with that information, look to see where this offering is made. So I'll ask the kids if you can see it in verse 30. I'll ask you, Where's the altar built? Is the altar built on the valley floor? Is the altar built on both of the mountains? What's the answer? The altar is built where? On, friends, on Mount Ebal. It is built on the Mount of Cursing. Don't you see the message from God? Don't you see what God is doing here? He is showing his people clearly again the path to forgiveness for their disobedience. Yes, there is cursing for disobedience. Yes, there is judgment, but don't you see God is showing them that he would accept a victim, an innocent victim in their place. God is pointing them to the fact that he would accept a sacrifice, a substitute for them. And doesn't that thrill your heart? Because I think if you're a Christian in the room, surely you recognize what this is pointing you to. Do you? And to see you forgiven. You are disobedient. You have broken God's law. But to see you forgiven for that disobedience, what has happened? But an offering has been made for you. 
The very Son of God himself has gone up the Mount of Cursing for you. What did we say last time out? Do you remember? What did we see at AI? That he became a curse. There's a curse that should be for you and he became a curse for you that you might be redeemed from that. You are being pointed in Joshua 8 to Calvary. But then we close with the other offering in verse 31 because we're told there is also a peace offering. So again, I ask you, it's a strange question, I suppose, but again, I ask you, uh, are you familiar with the offering system in the Old Testament? If you are, you know that the peace offering was very, very different to the burnt offering. What did we say a moment ago? Where the burnt offering was wholly given over to God, not so with the peace offering. I love this detail. With the peace offering, where most of the parts of the animal were supposed to be given over to God, the worshiper in the peace offering was to keep part of the meat for themselves. Now, Christian friend, do you not see the significance of that and how marvelous it is? Do you not? That the worshiper, having had their sin dealt with, they've had their sin atoned for, they could now enjoy this meal with the Almighty. They could enjoy this sharing, this participation with God. God eating, them eating of the same thing, the same of. That's why in Scripture, very often it's rendered a fellowship offering. It is so often in the Bible associated with joy. Deuteronomy 27 tells you that these people, they offered this peace offering and then they danced. They rejoiced because of the intimate fellowship they had with God because of their forgiven sin. And yes, this morning, you and I, if if you're a Christian, we can delight as well, can't we? Because we know what this points us to. We are forgiven. All of that guilt and disobedience and the shame of it is gone. And what happens this morning? Why is corporate worship so special? Because we come in here forgiven, redeemed. We get to enjoy a peace offering. Right now, you get to enjoy that fellowship, that participation with the eternal God, all on the basis of Christ's spilled blood. Yes, we could go linger there, but I want to end just by speaking to you at home, on the live stream, on the video, in this room, who doesn't know Jesus Christ. I want to tell you how you can have that fellowship with God. Because if you got your GPS, anyone remember where we are? Shechem. What you need to know is, in the New Testament, Shechem goes by a different name. In the New Testament, Shechem goes by the name Sychar. Ringing any bells? Come on. So this beautiful valley, this lush valley, shaped like an amphitheater where Jacob He bought that strip of land. He went on to build a well. And this very location where they worship, many years later, is where the Lord Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry, he comes for water, and he meets the woman of Samaria at the well. At this very spot, and if you are not a Christian, I want you to hear very clearly what Jesus says to this person This person who is desperate for satisfaction, this woman who has been going about doing all things, looking for fulfillment, cannot find any. And Jesus says to her, whoever drinks of the water that only he gives, that person will never be thirsty again. If you're not a Christian, I hope you understand the meaning of that, that it is only Jesus Christ who can satisfy your soul. It is only Jesus Christ who can provide you with fellowship and forgiveness. Jesus Christ has lived perfectly and died and opened the way to the most holy place, the the curtain of the temple tearing. And this morning, Jesus Christ in the gospel invites you to God. What are you going to do? What would stop you this morning in worship, in this worship service? Go to God in Christ and receive forgiveness and no fellowship with him.
Friends, let's bow and pray.